Welcome to episode 131 of the Various and Sundry podcast. I am your host, Matt Harmon, joined live from the Vault Studio. Actually, not the Vault Studio, live from our virtual studio. Mm -hmm. It's old habits. By my good friend, my colleague, my co-host, and the man who is seeking to grow the best grass in Columbia City, John Scott Sloat. Doc, what's going on this morning? Well, uh, we have a special episode today. Uh, we should probably clarify for, maybe we might have some people who don't normally listen to the podcast who are listening today because we have an esteemed guest. So we should probably clarify that when I say you're seeking to grow the best grass in Columbia. Yeah, that's, State, not, a dr- that's not a drug reference. Yeah, it is not a drug reference. No, it is literally the best lawn in, uh, in Columbia City. Yes. Mm-hmm. So probably helpful to clarify that. But Indeed. If you're new to the show or if you're old to the show, you can find us on Twitter at VNSPod. You can email the show, variousandsundrypodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and on YouTube at uh, Various and Sundry Podcast. So we uh, are joined by a special guest today. Our guest is Randy Newman. He is the Senior Fellow for Apologetics and Evangelism at the C.S. Lewis Institute. He has taught at several evangelical seminaries, and after serving for over 30 years with Campus Crusade for Christ, he established Connection Points, a ministry to help Christians engage people's hearts the way Jesus did. He has written numerous books and articles on evangelism and other ways our lives intertwine with God's creation. He earned his MDiv and his PhD in Intercultural Studies from Trinity International University. So, Randy, welcome to the program. Uh, it's great to be with you. Thanks so much. Yeah, so, uh, Randy, I'm trying to think, how how far back do we go in terms of, we we met through Campus Crusade. Yes. But I'm trying to, to remember how far back that goes. Um, well, <clears throat> I think it was... Um, uh maybe around 2004 or so because i remember we did a conference i was with faculty ministry and i think you were pursuing your phd at the time and i I think you had been on staff with campus crusade but then you were doing graduate work and we had this program with kind of connecting with grad students i think you know so somehow i remember that conference it was in atlanta Maybe that's where we connected, but, um, and then you and I have taught together at a couple of different staff conferences and, and then just stayed in touch. And um, I remember one summer you, you actually were teaching a whole bunch of us or or helping all of us who had already taken seminary Greek, trying to resurrect that. And, (laughs) and, and we read Greek and, um, and and most of us just grew in admiration for Matt Harmon because we thought, Either he's brilliant or we're all morons and, 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 and probably both. So, I mean, but um, so it's been a long time and it, it uh, has. glad to reconnect again. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so uh, as, as our regular uh, listeners know, uh, we have been uh, working through Randy's book, uh, Mere Evangelism. We get the title right. Ten Insights from C.S. Lewis to help you share your faith. And we will uh, talk a good bit about the book here in our uh, in our interview. But uh, I wanted to start with uh, having Randy just tell us a little bit about your, your background, mm-hmm. how you came to faith in Jesus. And um, we'll, we'll start there and we'll kind of move on from that to your ministry background. Sure, sure. Um... Uh, well, I, I grew up uh, in a Jewish home, I grew up in suburbs of New York City, and was raised Jewish, and uh, didn't hear anything about Christianity at all, other than the fact that they were they believed very, very different things than we did, and we didn't believe in Jesus. That, that may be the one strong lesson. And so um, I, I really didn't connect at all with any Christians in any thoughtful way until I was in high school, and... Um, I took Judaism more seriously than the rest of my family, but it um, it just never connected me to God, no matter how observant I was or how keeping of the commandments I might have been. And um, 
I met a group of Christian friends in high school who really had this dynamic personal relationship with God. And they, they prayed about everything. They talked about God like he was right there. They, they prayed in English, which I thought was an unfair advantage. I thought, I thought, I thought you, had to, you had to learn Hebrew in order to talk to God. And, um, and so it was their you know, interaction with them that really attracted me to this idea of knowing God in a deep personal way. Um, they suggested that I read the New Testament, and I stayed a million miles away from that because I had been trained by my rabbi that that was an anti-Semitic book. Um, they suggest I read some book by some British guy named C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity, <clears throat> but I didn't do any of that. I went off to college and, and decided that life was absurd and meaningless, so I read a lot of absurd literature and watched a lot of Woody Allen movies and got drunk a whole lot. And um, somewhere in the middle of my second year, though, uh, a friend of mine died in this really tragic accident. And I just started really wrestling with deeper issues. And so I started reading the New Testament that, that those friends back in high school had given me years before. They gave me a paperback New Testament. I, I didn't open it for three and a half years, but I took it with me away to college. Isn't that interesting? Mm. Um, and then I also went to the library and took out C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. I wasn't going to buy the book by some, I don't know. But, but the Lord used my realization of who Jesus was in the Gospel of Matthew and Lewis's rational arguments um, that brought it all together. Um, so, um, so I have a, 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 a deep love for C.S. Lewis, a, a, a tremendous valuing of the power of the scriptures and uh, that weaving together of, you know, good, rational arguments with God's revelation uh, brought it all together. And, and for me also, it was seeing that Judaism and Christianity are not antithetical. They fit perfectly together. Uh, it's really a beautiful kind of fulfillment. So I, I, I don't know how much more you want. I mean, I, I can say a whole lot more if you want me to, but... Uh. <laughs> So, uh, Randy, one thing uh, that, that you don't know about me is I am from uh, Long Island, uh, New York. No kidding. Oh, yes. we should turn on the accents. Let's go. So, where? Suffolk County, North, Northern, uh, Nassau County. Nassau Upper County. Island, yeah. Nassau yeah. County, Upper, uh, uh, North Shore, South Shore. Uh, right in the middle, Huntington Station. I know Huntington Station. Well, I'm, I'm not, um, I grew up not far from North Babylon. Ah, okay. Um, I, I think it's hysterical uh, looking back at it. I, I, I first heard the gospel in Babylon. <laughs> uh, I did. I, I, the first Presbyterian Church of Babylon. And growing up there, I, I didn't know anything at all about the biblical reference about that. It was years later, I was like, Babylon? <laughs> so, okay. Well, but I'll, I'll turn the accent back off. Otherwise, I'll scare <laughs> off your listeners. <laughs> yes. Uh, John, John's roots in New York uh, tend to come up relatively often uh, on the pod it, it, i mean it's rooted all it, it connects with his uh sporting interests as well in terms of being a knicks fan and a mets fan so yes and uh there's a lot of family pride in being from new york so we left when i was a child uh but i remember doing a tour of a of a fort in florida i believe and it was a civil war era fort and it just never got done and 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 all these things and they said on the tour that New Yorkers had to come in and finish the fort. And, and my dad just going, you hear that? That's our people. I mean, <laughs> come down here and finish things. Yeah. And people have been moving from New York to Florida. Ever <laughs> yes. <since>. yes. <laughs> um, oh, my. Yeah. I'm sorry. What was the point of this uh, podcast? Episode? <laughs> I think we lost something somewhere along the lines. Well, Here's, I mean, there's a reason we call it. Sorry. There's a reason we call it the various and sundry podcast because yeah. our, our conversations roam just about mm -hmm. everywhere. So mm -hmm. it's really hard to get truly off topic uh, on, on this podcast. So mm. I, I feel like I take that as a challenge. But <laughs> <laughs> so so maybe tell us a little bit about your um, about going into ministry. Then you tell us a little bit about your conversion. Right. Um, but then uh, tell us about your path into ministry and, 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 and how you eventually ended up where you are today in ministry. Mm. Uh, well, I uh, went off to college. Like I said, I majored in music. Um, and by the way, music is also a big part of my testimony. I, I, I was searching for some musical experience that would be transcendent or beautiful or meaningful or something. 
And uh, for me, that place in mere Christianity where, where Lewis talks about hope and about all these experiences that are disappointing, you know, the, the vacation may have been a great vacation, but it was disappointing and the spouse and the job and whatever it is. And, and he has that, that just amazing quote of, if I, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Hmm. And when I read that, that brought all of the pieces together because I was looking for music to be the satisfaction, but music was just a pointer to the other world hmm. that we're made for, the world of eternity, the world of heaven, the world of God. Um, so um, so when that happened, it, it changed my perspective on music. I mean, I, I finished my degree in music and I worked for a couple of years as a music teacher, but... Um, I was also volunteering for Campus Crusade and leading a Bible study in a dorm, and that was just so much more dynamic and exciting for me. There were students there from all over the world, and it was it was just it was it was you know that was more a sense of calling um, than being a music teacher. Um, it, it didn't hurt that I started dating this really wonderful woman who was on staff with Campus Crusade, who's now my wife. So. Um, uh, so joined Campus Crusade and we worked in a number of different campuses. And as I look back at it, um, I, I was always on campuses where things were really, really difficult and the standard Campus Crusade strategies just didn't work. I was always on the East Coast in big cities, significant Jewish populations, Catholic populations, uh, international students. And the success stories that I heard in Campus Crusade were places in our country where standard evangelistic uh, ideas just bore more fruit, the Midwest and the South, you know, so, and that's just a cultural reality. So I had to experiment and try things because none of the standard stuff was working. And in particular at uh, Towson State in Baltimore, I was given a lot of freedom by my leaders um, to experiment and try things because nothing else was working. And so uh, we started incorporating much more dialogue, much more back and forth conversation with people, um, much more discussions about all sorts of other topics and finding supernatural threads in them. So talking about music or talking about art or talking about justice or talking about a million other topics other than spiritual stuff, but then showing the connections there and um and the lord really blessed that so um somewhere in the midst of all of that um some people encouraged me to do some writing i, I was doing a lot of teaching about asking questions in evangelism and I, I started saying sometimes i think the questions we ask or answering questions with a question rather than an answer may be more fruitful for engaging people so i um uh, I started, I, I wrote, uh, I wrote it as an article and it got published and I got some encouragement to write it as a book. And so um, right around the time that you and I met, I had just finished the first book, Questioning Evangelism. And, and that has just opened up a lot of really wonderful doors to um, help encourage people in reaching out to non-Christians God has placed around them. Um, I, I should also dive in with, I, I'm just not one of those extroverted bold evangelists i just um you know we um i don't know maybe you remember uh, from your time with campus crusade man i well, the speakers we always heard at least in my ears they always made it sound like evangelism was easy and natural and every day and they they couldn't imagine not evangelizing and i remember yeah oh i i, I can imagine not evangelizing i, I, <laughs> I vivid images of what that could look like and it looks really kind of nice um so I, I just, I, I struggled with it. I still struggle with it. And I, I find that uh, sometimes sharing that and telling people that I'm a fellow struggler um, kind of encourages and helps people. So that's kind of shaped um, where things have gone. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm leaving parts out. I'm, I'm, you know, I think you intimidated when various and sundry. I feel, I feel like I, I've got to, I've got to cover all the various and all the sundry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I'm doing that. <clears throat> So you, uh, so you were on staff with uh, Campus Crusade slash crew uh, 
until how many years ago? So probably about eight or nine years ago. Okay. And then where did you go after that? Right. Well, um, you know, I mean, I live in the Washington, D.C. area and the C.S. Lewis Institute started here in this area, but we also have other uh, locations now around the whole world. Um, and I, um, one of their, at the time, their, their president, Tom Terrence, heard me speak at a church and he said, you know, I think your approach to evangelism really fits well with our discipleship program. We had a, a we still have a, a year long discipleship program. So I started doing some speaking for them and, and, and the book Questioning Evangelism opened up some other speaking things. And after a while, I just, I, I couldn't do everything. I mean, it was just too much. And it seemed that the Lord was really leading us to uh, say goodbye to Campus Crusade. It was a great experience, learned a ton. Um, and so now I do much more with the C.S. Lewis Institute and then some other teaching things. Um, so, so yes, so for the last eight years, it's been that uh, my, my home base is the, uh, the Lewis Institute. But then, um, like I said, the Lord opened up a bunch of other teaching things. And I've been able to write a few more books to help people think more about evangelism. Excellent. John, why don't you jump in? We ready to jump into the book? Can, yeah, can let's it, do it. Yeah. I mean, it's a natural segue, I think. So, I mean, yeah. you know, Randy himself is a, uh, is a professional podcaster. So, I mean, we, we are in the presence of a, uh, of a, of a professional here. So we <laughs> amateurs have much to learn from his, uh, from his professionalism here. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> listeners don't know this. We forgot to hit the record button earlier and we, we had to start over, uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, just, just to speak to professionalism. Um, <laughs> uh, Randy, I, you know, I, as I was reading through this, I don't always think of C.S. Lewis as an evangelist. Yeah, I think I, I often think about him as an apologist. Yes. Um, do you have a sense of which Lewis viewed himself as, and and, and how will how does history remember him? Well, it's interesting. I, I I think you're exactly right. Many people don't think of him as an evangelist. Um, but he thought of himself as an evangelist. In mm. fact, he even said at one point that all of my writings are evangelistic, which is a pretty strong statement. I mean, you know, you can certainly see mere Christianity, the problem of pain, miracles. Those were, you know, direct arguments promoting the Christian faith. But his Narnia stories and the science fiction works were trying to give people uh, flavors and uh, pictures, images of what it would like to be living in a supernatural world uh, where there was a God, but we were searching for him. Um, uh, so if you are making the distinction about apologist versus evangelist, Lewis might say, yeah, I guess I'm more of an apologist, maybe. But he, I think he saw those things weaving more closely, yeah. intimately together. He did say, that he, he wished that he could be part of a, a two-man team mm -hmm. and he would come in first as the setup guy and give all the rational arguments and the logic and why you should believe this. And then the fiery evangelist would come in and, you know, close the deal and ask for a decision. Um, so, um, but it is interesting. I mean, he, he makes really strong appeals for belief in those radio broadcasts that eventually became mere Christianity. So if you look at the last section of each of the four sections of that book they, they grow in intensity actually I, I think I think at the end of the first series and I think they originally planned they were only going to have five radio broadcasts he has an appeal but it, it, it's kind of low pressure you know you, you really ought to think about this or something and then you know they got booked to do another five episodes and he decided to you know turn it you know real strongly and again it just builds mm -hmm. um so um Yes, I, I mean, my, the whole premise of putting together this book was, uh, I think there's a whole lot we can learn from C.S. Lewis, and I wanted to try to draw those lessons and put them all together in one book, and the people at the Good Book Company, uh, the publisher, they, they liked that idea. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, that was good that they said yes. Yeah. So uh, was there anything that surprised you in doing the research for this book? Uh, with Lewis and evangelism, obviously it wasn't like you were coming to Lewis uh, as a blank slate. You're obviously very familiar with him by the time you sat down to actually write this book, but was there anything in the process of doing the research or the writing that 
maybe surprised you or caught you off guard about Lewis and his approach to evangelism? Mm, wow, that's good. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, I will, um, I promise I will answer the question, but let me back up of, it all started with a, a lot of time, well, every, every time I'm doing teaching in evangelism, I talk about the very big importance of pre-evangelism. All of these conversations and things we can do, which pave the way for a presentation of the gospel and make it more plausible that people will even consider it. And I just think that Lewis was a genius at it. Um, again, those radio broadcasts, he spent four of those first five weeks just talking about how do we know anything? Well, you know, why do, we, why, do we, why do we believe in right and wrong? And we all do believe in right and wrong. And he, I mean, he has this whole, the whole first episode was, we all have this sense of right and wrong. Someone takes our seat on the bus and we say, hey, I was sitting there. Or um, so, so there is this innate sense in right and wrong. And all he was trying to do in that first episode was say, we all believe this and we all fall short of it. We all believe in some sort of right and wrong. And yet we're all guilty of not living up to it. There's nothing about God, nothing about the Bible, nothing about Jesus, you know, for the first 15 minutes about, you know, something inside of us right and wrong. And so I, I, I thought that it was going to be a whole entire book about pre-evangelism and what we can learn from C.S. Lewis about it. But it turns out that there was so much more. I mean, that was just the starting point. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if there were too many surprises. I, I will say it was really a whole lot of fun to write the book in that it was a whole lot of work too. It wasn't easy, um, but it was fun in that I, I had been reading C.S. Lewis for 40 years and he was so instrumental in my coming to faith. So it was like pulling and drawing upon, oh, there was that time mm -hmm. he said this in that book and that book. And um, so it, it was this culmination of a lot of my thinking about evangelism and about Lewis. Um, trying to think about, uh, you asked about surprises. Um, I, I, re I really don't think there was there was too much surprise, but I did grow tremendously in my valuing of how Lewis, um, Lewis engaged the imagination. Uh, and and that, that's what he did. And, and so much of evangelism and apologetics doesn't even do it all. Um, a lot of our evangelism and apologetics is um, argument, argument, reason. Here's why you should believe. And, and he does that too. So I'm not saying that's bad. But along the way, Lewis wove in a million analogies so that in addition to people getting convinced, you know, I really should believe this, he also gave them experiences and feelings of, oh, this is what it would feel like to become a Christian. And, um, and so that's, that's the challenge, I think, for us is as we're telling our testimonies, as we're talking to people, it's not just reason, 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 it's picture, imagery. Um, I, 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 there's one big long list that uh, Michael Ward put together of all the different images Lewis used in his various writings about what it means to become a Christian or what it feels like. And, you know, it's, it's like um, laying down our rebel arms. It's falling at someone's feet. It's drowning and having someone throw us a life preserver it's turning full speed astern <laughs> i mean that, that's that, that i mean it makes you laugh and smile and kind of ooh, this sounds good i i really wish this were true before hmm, maybe it is true hmm. um so that i think that was the area that i grew uh, the most in by the way, I have this, we have a short, I, I don't know if this will be edited out of your final version or whatever, but um, uh, people just decided this is the very best time to mow their lawn right outside. My <laughs> so I don't know if you're hearing any noise, but um, I, I'm hearing a lot of noise. I hope this is not messing things up. No, I trust me. Uh, we on a semi-regular basis have uh, background noise in our episodes, whether it's mowing, because the studio we normally record in um, is on an outside wall. And so we'd have, you know, they'd choose to always mow right when we're recording. 
Uh, e but even uh, more challenging is the fact that our normal studio is uh, right above our worship arts area where they have people practicing. And so we will often have unintentional musical accompaniments oh, faintly nice. in the background. Okay. All right. Okay. So, All right. so our, yeah. our listeners are more than prepared for ambient noise. All right. And us and us talking about it. We we, yes. we end up talking about the ambient noise all the time. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Boy, this is various and sundry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Randy, something uh, something that stood out to me several times throughout the book is how much uh, space you gave for like, all right, I want you to pause and reflect hmm. uh, on 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 this. It, it was nearly every chapter, if not every chapter, um, and it that that got me curious. Uh, what role does ref, uh, sort of that pre-reflection on the evangelist, uh, what role does that play in evangelism in, in your framework and thinking? Oh, I, I, I think it's a huge part. Um, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that you noticed that um, because the original plan was that every chapter would have at the end, you know, like a separate thing, points to ponder or application points or, you know, something like that. And I remember thinking about that, and it's like, I always skip those pages when I'm reading. And so I, I, I don't want to do this, because I, I just think people will never read them. And, you know, here's five steps to take. Oh, no, please, let me go on to the next chapter. So, so I wanted instead to weave it into the prose of the chapter toward the end. And so, yes, because I wanted to make this, uh, I, I didn't want this book to have the, the only effect of, wow, C.S. Lewis really was a cool guy. The end. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I want people to go, okay, wait a minute. Well, who do I know any people that might respond to that line of reasoning the way Lewis responded to Tolkien when they said, etc.? So, so, um, so that's one part of the answer to your question. The other one is, I, I think a lot of people have this idea that. Um, our task as a uh, as a witness for the gospel is we have a, uh, a prepared presentation and we know it really well. And when the opportunity comes, it's like, push the button, da-da, here's the, pre here it is, here's there, there, I evangelized. And, and there, is, there is that aspect about evangelism. There is the proclaiming of a gospel message and we need to be very clear and concise. But there's a million ways that we can arrive at that or a million objections that people might have. And I think the more we can think through, well, let's see, what, what might they ask or how might they say that? Or if they say this, what would be something that I could say? How does, how does the gospel shine its light on that aspect of life? And so I, 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 I make much of Peter's statement, always be ready. Um, for anyone who asks you. And, and so I think that that can be tremendously helpful of just preparing our mind of, you know, if they say that, um, well, you know, the last time that came up, here's what I said, and it, it didn't work very well. I think I need to come up with a different answer. Hmm. So I, I just think there's a whole lot of that that we need. Um, um, I think, I, I don't think I say it in this book, but in some of my teaching, I say, I, I think some of us think of evangelism as, it's like it's like learning how to ride a bicycle at first it's really difficult and and you know you keep falling down and getting hurt or whatever but what but once you got it well then you don't even think about it anymore it's just natural you get on a bicycle and you know i don't think that's the way it is i i think it's much more of boy every situation is different and yes the message is the same but how i articulate it and how i come to it and where do i need to clarify what what are are they are they going to be more hung up about this aspect of things or this aspect of things and so it's much more of a coaching kind of thing rather than a learning a skill and there now i've got it. Mm -hmm. so I, I wanted to uh you mentioned this earlier i'm going to circle back to this because this was an area that i thought was especially um insightful is in the book you talk about what you call clues mm. and so um i i wanted to have you explain what you mean by that and and why they're helpful in evangelism mm, yeah well and and again i think this is one of the very uh, a strong suit of lewis 
that has not been used a whole lot by a lot of other people. So um, he, um, the, the whole first series of radio broadcasts, he put as, uh, underneath the banner of right and wrong as clues to the meaning of the universe. Mm. So he's saying there's something that we all innately kind of know, right and wrong. Well, and, and isn't that a beautiful word, clue? Uh, a clue kind of opens up the possibility of, oh, maybe it's pointing in that direction. Mm-hmm. And so then, um, and then you read a lot of other of Lewis's stuff. So beauty is a clue. Why, why is the world so beautiful? And um, um, uh, people longing to connect with each other in, in close friendships. Friendship is a clue. Um, the kind of intimacy that we hope for in marriage is a clue of a greater intimacy. And, and so he, he spent a lot of time pointing at the clue and helping people appreciate it and then saying, here's how it's a pointer. And again, you know, that for me, it was, it was um, the beauty of music and the disappointment of music. Um, I, I was always struck. I would go every Saturday night to the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. And I was hoping to hear, you know, the piece of music that was going to be my piece of music. And there were certain, there were several pieces of music that, that came really close to doing that, except for the piece of music would end. And it was over. And I had to leave the concert hall and you know get back on the subway and go back to my dorm room and uh, what you know what, what where did Rachmaninoff go? It, it's gone. It's you know, like could we get that back somehow? So so what I want people to do is I, I want people to look at the areas of their life that they particularly really enjoy and ask. A, is it possible that that's a clue to another world or a greater beauty or um, uh, a fuller meaning of life? Um, so for me, it's music and art, but for some people, it's it's uh, you know really good friendships. They just love getting together with other people, and 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 when someone just really connect with another person. You know, they know what you're going to say before you even say it. It's like, I, w- I was meant for intimacy. I was meant for community. Well, that's a pointer to a God who is himself in community, a triune God, but he created us to be part of a greater community of connectedness. Um, I, I, I've even heard... Um, People talk about, and I, I know you guys are really into sports, but I, I, I never thought of this before, but, but um, that an experience of being at a sporting event and cheering at the same time as 18,000 other people or, or groaning at the same time of 18,000 people when it's the other, like, there's something we're meant to be part of this large group celebration and a, a common cause and... Mm-hmm. Um, depending on where you live and how your team is doing, it's it's either a, a very delightful pointer or a excruciatingly painful one. So, um, so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but but so there's all these things that that are clues. Oh, uh, Lewis made a very big deal about keeping second things second, and that's mm-hmm. that's a really important theme in his life. And it, it has been a really important thing in my life in that for, for a long time, before I became a Christian, I, I was looking for something else to be, I would never use the word, but I, I was looking for it to be salvific. Um, you know, th- this is, this is going to be the ultimate experience, either the piece of music or the, or the romantic relationship or, or the, you know, the, seeing the beautiful sunset. And when you look to those things to be ultimate, first things, they're terribly disappointing. I mean, um, well, so, um, but if you, but if you have first things first, as in a relationship with God, then, then so many of those second things become so, so much more delightful. You're not, you're not expecting them to be a God. You're just enjoying them as a gift. And I, I enjoy music so much more now that I'm not expecting it to save me. No, that, that that's really helpful. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think, I, I think you even mentioned it in, in the, uh, in the book that that seems to be an insight that 
that Tim Keller has um, emphasized even in his discussion of idolatry. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so I, I, another sort of subtext of, of this program is, uh, is John is a big Timmy K uh, fan. Uh, mm -hmm. Fan's the wrong word. Uh, he, appre he, he greatly appreciates uh, Tim Keller. And so anytime we can work in a reference to, to Timmy K, we, we try to do so here. Yeah. <laughs> the restraining order has made that very difficult to be a fan, yeah. but you know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's going strong. <laughs> well, well, and, and Keller freely admits that he, he was influenced so much by Lewis. Um, I think Keller brought all of that kind of mindset and then was led by God to come to sophisticated, educated, Manhattan mm -hmm. and okay so how do how do we reach these people and um you know th there is there there's there's a uh, I don't I don't know the best wording for it there, there's a kind of negative approach to apologetics which is ah you're looking for that that's wrong or look at you you're 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 I you're making an idol of romantic relationships or you're making an idol of your career stop that cut that out you're only going to find it in Jesus. Okay. And, and, and there is a, there is a valid uh, biblical basis for that approach to apologetics, but there's a more positive uh, one and Keller embodies it really well. I think Lewis did. It's where you say you're looking for something in those relationships. Yeah. Yeah. You're looking for intimacy and connectedness. That's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, God created us for that. But you know what? You're not going to get it in that relationship. It's just a pointer to this greater relationship. Or you're looking to you're you're looking to pleasure. Well, yeah, God, God has made this world to be a very pleasurable place. Food is delicious. Um, sunsets are gorgeous. And so, yes, but no, you're probably not, you're not going to get it ultimately there. Um, you're going to get it in God and his son, Jesus. So um, I think Keller has talked about this. It's the yes, but no, but yes, approach to apologetics. <laughs> and it starts with, yeah, I understand why you want that relationship to work. Sure, we're meant to, but no, but yes. I'm, anyway, so I'm belaboring the point, which people tell me I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's good to have an editor. Randy, you already said this 12 times. Cut this out. <laughs> uh, Doc, uh, I got one more question. Do we have time for it? Or? Yeah, let's do one more question. Okay. And then uh, I want to make sure we give some time here to briefly at least highlight Randy's other books on evangelism and one other uh, basically brand new resource that, that he has put together that we want to highlight. So go ahead and ask that final question. Yeah, it, it may be a real simple question, Randy, but uh, at one point in your book, you mentioned that you used to use uh, pamphlets or uh, something like that, and, and you would read through uh, different spiritual laws or, or, or something, uh, right. and that you've changed now to your cell phone, uh, to showing people, and that's less awkward or, or, or weird. Um, and, and that got me just curious, uh, uh, in your experience in evangelism, what, what else has changed? Oh, my did you say this was a simple question? <laughs> wow. Well, I, I was thinking like, well, really the, the, the delivery systems may have changed, but the message itself, the, 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 right. uh, the relationships haven't changed necessarily, but, but uh, yeah, it just got me, it just got me curious. Well, I, I, I will, I, I will be able to keep this brief. Uh, two things is I, I think for a lot of people, the starting point is different for, mm. for a lot of non-Christians. It used to be they, they already shared a bunch of common beliefs with you. So if you said to someone, would, would you like to know God personally? Well, the God that they were then thinking about was the same God that you were talking about. So it was like, well, yeah. So, um, and gee, knowing God sounds like it would be a good thing. And how do I do that? And you could quote the Bible and they would, even people who've never read the Bible 50 years ago, they would think the Bible's, you know, a pretty good book. And it's probably a thing I should listen to and probably has some authority. Um, I just think people today are much further back of, if you said, would you like to know God personally? They're saying, well, which God are you talking about? I mean, like a million of them. And, yeah. you know, my next door neighbor is a Buddhist and the guy across the street is a Muslim. And uh, I went to college and my favorite professor was an atheist. Like, 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 
you have to have a whole lot more conversation of, well, let me tell you about the God that I'm talking about before you even get around to what it would be like to know him personally. Hmm. Um, so that's, so the starting point is further back for a lot of people, not always, not everybody, but um, uh, uh, if I can say it, our, our world is a lot more like Athens that Paul faced in Acts 17 than uh, a Jewish culture like Paul faced in Acts 13 in a synagogue. Hmm. And if you study and com- contrast those two approaches, it's just, it's a different starting point. Uh, in the Jewish synagogue, he didn't have to say, now here's the God I'm talking about. They already knew what God he was talking about. Yeah. So, and they already believed that the Bible was a, was a God's revelation of who this God is and how he works in history. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, we, we need to uh, anticipate, again, this is not always the case, but we need to anticipate a higher level of hostility. Um, for, for a long time, even people who weren't interested in spiritual things, they kind of thought, well, I think, you know, it's good for you. Okay, if you find stuff in there, it's good for you. It's, they were neutral. Now it's religion. Religion is a source of all sorts of wickedness and horrible evil in the world and intolerance and homophobia. And you, you, you're the cause of problems in our world. So that, that's just a whole different, I mean, the temperature's 20 degrees hotter than it used to be. And, yeah. and we just, we need to anticipate that and know how to step into that and not be naive and to think they're going to love me when I talk about Jesus. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot more I could say, but that, that's the shortest, short, a shorter answer to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, all right. I want to, I want to end this section just by doing a uh, kind of rapid fire on, uh, on Randy's uh, books here. So, uh, so I'll, I'll name the title and Randy, if you could give me like a, a brief, like 20 to 30 second snippet on what it's about and why it might be helpful. So challenge accepted. All right, here we go. Uh, first one questioning evangelism, engaging people's hearts the way Jesus did. Well, it's the whole idea about making evangelism much more of a two-way dialogue and using questions for delivering our message. Okay. Corner conversations, engaging dialogues about God and life. A book that is now mostly out of print and not all that terribly relevant. I'm sorry. (laughs) So if you read it, you're among a very select few. (laughs) Okay. It was, sample, it was sample conversations of what this could look like, but yeah, it was yeah. very dated and it's 20 years old now, so it's okay. Uh, bringing the gospel home, witnessing to family members, close friends, and others who know you well. Yeah, I, I, I decided to shine the light on if this is what evangelism looks like, what are the unique challenges of talking to family members and people who really know you well? So. It was about family evangelism, and it explores a lot more of the emotions and challenges there. Okay. Uh, Unlikely converts, improbable stories of faith, and what they teach us about evangelism. Um, Well, my my doctoral dissertation was all about conversion and how people become Christians. So I interviewed 40 recent converts, and then since then I've interviewed a whole lot more. And I just think those stories are, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, but they teach us a lot about if I could say it so coarsely, what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that there was a lot of encouragement in those stories. So I collected them and said, here's what we can learn about. Uh, Learn about evangelism. Excellent. Okay. And this last one, I'll I'll give you a little bit more time to talk about. Uh, You recently put together a teaching series. I think it's called Evangelism in the 21st Century. Mm -hmm. And it's a series of YouTube videos. recordings where you ranging anywhere from what I could gather, like 25 to 45 minutes, depending on what topic you were talking about. So tell us a little bit about uh, that series, what you hope to accomplish and what, uh, what listeners might gain from looking at that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although um, uh, you left one of my books out and Uh oh, I'm so sorry. My publisher will, will, would say, Hey, wait a minute. So I had the great privilege of being part of a series. There's this whole series that the good book company called uh, uh, published called engaging with and and there's engaging with muslims engaging with atheists engaging with hindus there's a brand new one on engaging with mormons 
And I had the privilege of doing the one on engaging with Jewish people. So okay. um, I'm, I'm not just doing that to plug my book. That whole series, I think, is really good. They're really short. Um, and so I, I didn't want to leave that out. No, we'll try um, to make sure we get a link to that in the in the show notes to include that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good series. Um, so the videos, I was contacted by a seminary in uh, India, uh, and they wanted they they wanted me to put together a, a course on evangelism with videos and written assignments and all that. So it'd be like a standalone product that they could offer to their students without flying me over to India or flying any professors over. So it's, it's mm-hmm. going to be a total online package. So I recorded these videos and then I adapted them for a larger audience. And um, the people who uh, church filmed me and edited them and uh, the, the, the seminary that, you know, put this together said, you, you know, you, you can use the videos any way you want. Uh, we're going to use them for this course that people will register for. So um, I just thought, what this is great. And uh, and again, the, the people who videotaped it and edited it at this at this church helped me put it together to be on YouTube. And it's a way to get evangelism training to a lot of people who may probably never go to seminary and may not sign up for a course. But here, just in their home, watch eight 30-minute videos about how, how do we think about evangelism? What are the unique challenges in our world today? And uh, it was, it was a, a great project to be a part of. And um, I'm praying that God uses it in ways that I, I can't even imagine. Um, but it, it's just getting uh, evangelism training uh, to anybody who wants to find it on YouTube. Excellent. Yeah, we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. Link to all um, of them. We'll link all of them. That's right. And it's important because, you know, you can't just search on Randy Newman and uh, assume you're going to get this version of Randy Newman. You might get some other Randy Newman, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he yes, he, he wrote the music to Toy Story. There's this other Randy Newman, a composer. He wrote the music to Toy Story. He, uh, he wrote the song Short People, which has anybody under five eight really really mad at me uh and um so yes that's a that's that other randy newman i i I am kind of curious if people go searching on youtube for that randy newman because they really like the theme of the television show monk he wrote that you know it's like oh here's this other guy you know he kind of looks a little bit like him could he could this be the same guy and so who knows maybe the lord will use it in very odd ways i think that'd be fun yeah you never know you never know all right, so Johnny, ready to move on to uh, one thing you liked? Yeah, yeah. You want me to go first? I want you to go first. Yep. All right. So recently, I had a flight from uh, uh, from Fort Wayne to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and had the opportunity to watch a movie that I think came out probably eight to ten months ago that everybody was talking about that I had no idea what it was, but got to watch it and really enjoyed it. I watched Dune uh, on the okay. plane. Um, never read the book, never even heard of it before the movie came out. So uh, really, really enjoyed that movie. Yeah, I, I, I've not seen the movie. Um, I, I read the, the series of books when I was a kid. Oh, really? So I'd be curious to go back and, and watch that at some point. But um, it was visu- visually stunning. The, yeah. The, the okay. Movie. All right. And uh, we've invited Randy to join us in our uh, One Thing you like segment. So Randy, do you have something uh, you'd like to add in terms of one thing you liked this week or recently? One thing I liked this week. Um, well, I've, um, I've kind of picked up this hobby of photography and going out and taking pictures. And almost a full year ago, um, I had a chance to go to uh, a workshop, or a photography workshop at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Oh, wow. I took a whole bunch of pictures and it was really, really fun. And then they were sitting in the camera forever. And I thought, no, nah, I, 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 I really want to put this together and get it printed up in a book. Um, so I finally, I, I, I forced myself, I said, I've got to do this before a whole year goes by. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I made it because it was August and I, 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 I got it done before August, put these pictures together, sent it off and the, and the album arrived in the mail. And it was just really fun looking at these pictures. They're not you know, they're not award-winning photos. I'm not going to put them in a, in a contest. And I don't think too many people will see them besides me 
I, I showed them to my wife. She she liked them. She's never going to look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I just have fun looking at it, remembering it. It was just some visual beauty, and that was really kind of a highlight of the week. Nice. Nice. Well, well mine is far less transcendent. Uh, <laughs> mine is uh, m- my wife and I watched a documentary on Fire Island. Do you remember this big news story from about five years ago? There was this um, uh, guy who organized what he claimed was going to be this like epic music festival on this island down in the uh, Caribbean. And so he got all these like major social media influencers to hype it up. He booked uh, prominent bands and Uh, It was basically a hoax. He didn't have anything really in place to make this happen. And so people flew down there uh, after spending like tens of thousands of dollars to be at this elite exclusive event, only to discover that, yeah, the bands aren't showing up. The villas we promised you'd live in aren't there, but here are some FEMA tents that you could stay in. There's really not enough food not much water, bathroom facilities are limited. And so it was just this documentary kind of walking through uh, this fraud. And so the guy ended up getting uh, sent to prison for wire fraud. There was some like shady financial stuff going on, but just wow. fascinating to see all of that uh, together. So where, where was that? Was that on, it was on Hulu? Hulu? Okay. Yep. So, and that's what you and your wife do for a romantic evening together. Boy, I, <laughs> well, I, I, I gotta I, tell you, that's. Uh, I, I didn't say it was romantic. I said I said we enjoyed watching the program. I I, yeah. I didn't sell it as a yes. Here's a romantic thing we can do together. <laughs> uh, I have a little better sense of of, of romance than that. Okay, you know, well, good to hear. All right, a little so. <laughs> Uh, well, John, I think we've uh, I think we've covered our various and sundry topics. Are you ready to call mission accomplished? Oh yes, I don't think we've ever had a guest that leaned into the various and sundry topics quite like uh, Randy did. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So, Randy, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your writing and teaching ministry. It, it is a blessing uh, to many, including me. And um, it's it's fun to see how the Lord continues to use you uh, mm. over the course of our friendship. And so uh, grateful for you. And uh, we, at some point, will reach out and get back to you about wanting to have uh, have you on the show to talk more extensively about Lewis. Uh, and so uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll get that on the calendar eventually here. But thanks again for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity. So, John, I think we're calling Mission Accomplished. And so all that's left to say is until next time, the Lord bless you all real good. Later.